and she's literally indistinguishable from a pop culture parody character. And barking mad black women in Congress are calling for black people to be excused from paying taxes on account of what Whitey done. And we're all supposed to pretend that this is sane and normal. Well, it's not. Today is April 20th, 24, uh, 2024, and I'm Joshua Slocum. We're going to discuss all of this and more tonight on Disaffected. And if you are watching on Saturday, you are seeing our very first live show. As I speak this out, you're hearing it. Welcome to it. Let's get right into NPR and Catherine Marr. So you recall from last week, NPR senior editor Uri Berliner published an expose that showed massive political bias at National Public Radio. All Democrats and zero Republicans in the editorial newsroom. 87 Democrats, zero Republicans. The network has a fixation on what it calls systemic racism. It would not talk about a COVID lab leak, no matter what. It ignored the Hunter Biden story, you know, a nothing burger. And Uri's article showed that the NPR audience over the past 10 to 12 years went from middle of the road, more liberals than conservatives, but now it's 67 percent liberals. And I believe the conservative uh, listenership has dropped from about uh, 23 percent down to 11 percent. Um, I made the easiest prediction in the world last week, and it came true. Uri didn't last long after he published that expose in Barry Weiss's The Free Press. NPR suspended him without pay for five days. And then the new CEO came along and attacked him without naming him, but she attacked him in an all staff memo. And we'll talk more about her later. Uh, first, I want to share with you a couple of things from constitutional lawyer Jonathan Turley. Quote, Berliner detailed the complete exclusion of any Republicans among editors of NPR's Washington office in various examples of raw bias in favor of Democratic narratives and claims. Marr responded to none of these specific points in substance. Instead, she attacks Berliner as, quote, profoundly disrespectful, hurtful, and demeaning to his colleagues by calling out the company for its political bias. Next quote. Well, first, notice the victim narcissism in that quote, profoundly disrespectful, hurtful, and demeaning. <laughs> it's the wounded bird. Next quote. In a memo Friday, Marr told the staff that Berliner attacked not only the quality of our editorial process and the integrity of our journalists, but our people on the basis of who we are. <laughs> That's just plain defamation. That's libel. She's lying. And, and claiming that Uri Berliner attacked the staff based on her, their personal identities, based on who they are. It's a brazen lie, but it shows that these people are unable or unwilling to think outside their cult paradigm. Nothing, nothing penetrates, no matter what. Here's a sample of the kind of thing that CEO Catherine Marr says on social media, and we're going to have much more after this. Quote, <laughs> I grew up feeling superior, ha, how white of me, because I was from New England and my part of the country didn't have slaves, or so I'd been taught. <laughs> grew up feeling superior. Everybody who lives in this goddamn region feels superior. Let's read a little bit from the All Hands memo that Catherine Marr put out. Quote, NPR's service to this aspirational mission was called in question this week in two distinct ways. The first was a critique of the quality of our editorial process and the integrity of our journalists. The second was a criticism of our people on the basis of who we are. <laughs> Next quote. Quote. <laughs> Asking a question about whether we're living up to our mission should always be fair game. After all, journalism is nothing if not hard questions. Questioning whether our people are serving our mission with integrity based on little more than the recognition of their identity is profoundly disrespectful, hurtful, and demeaning. God. 
She really packs it in. It's very typical of narcissistic women, modern narcissistic women. The wounded bird, she's doing victimology, you know. You herded my little boobies. Talks about feelings. This, what she's doing, this is actual white women's tears. <laughs> Not the fake kind used to shut up women who are saying something sensible. This is actual fake white women's tears. And it works. She has no idea that she's describing herself. Take a look at the projection here in this next quote. It's deeply simplistic to assert that the diversity of America can be reduced to any particular set of beliefs and faulty reasoning to infer that identity is determinative of one's thoughts or political leanings. First of all, I have to correct her. It is not infer, Catherine. It is imply. Where did you go to school? <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. You can graduate from Harvard and you can't do arithmetic past 10. Next quote. Continuing to uphold our excellence with confidence, having inclusive conversations that bridge perspectives, and learning more about the audiences we serve in order to continue to grow and thrive, adding more light to the illumination of who we are as a shared body public. I look forward to how we will do this work together. Catherine Marr, CEO. Warmly. Like a fresh baked cookie from mommy's oven. Here's the reality. Catherine Marr is a rich, attractive blonde at the head of National Public Radio, and she just railroaded a middle-aged white man named Uri Berliner. Take a look on your screen. Doesn't that say it all? <laughs> well, Uri has self-respect. He quit. He posted a little bit on Twitter of his resignation letter. I am resigning from NPR, a great American institution where I have worked for 25 years. I don't support calls to defund NPR. I respect the integrity of my colleagues and wish for NPR to thrive and do important journalism. But I cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR I cite in my free press essay. Yes, indeed. Let me introduce you to the comic character Titania McGrath. She's a creation of the British comedian and commentator Andrew Doyle. Uh, she's the Simon Pure Essence of the woke white blonde lady savior. Here she is. I'm going to have to get my borderline glasses out for this. This is her, her Twitter profile. Titania McGrath, healer, activist, radical intersectionalist poet, non-white, ecosexual, pronouns, variable. Selfless and brave. Buy my books. <laughs> and here are a few of the things that Titania says in public. <laughs> I am deeply disturbed to see that the transport for London has unveiled six new overground lines and not one of them is named after Greta Thunberg. Peace be upon her. <laughs> Next one. I'm so sick of white saviors trying to provide clean drinking water to poor people in Africa. As members of the BIPOC community, Africans much prefer dehydration to the perpetuation of white structures of power and privilege. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Thank you, Johns Hopkins, for reminding us that woman is an outdated and offensive term. From now on, the phrase is non-man. <laughs> and she's actually quoting, Titania is, from uh, Johns Hopkins University's LGBTQ glossary, which says, uh, definition, lesbian sexual orientation, a non-man attracted to non-men. I non-understand that. Now, let's compare Titania to the real-life Catherine Marr. And she's definitely getting the voice. <laughs> First one. I'm so done with late-stage capitalism. Next one. Yes, the North. Yes, all of us. Yes, America. Yes, our original collective sin and unpaid debt. Yes, reparations. Yes, on this day. It's almost like one of those orgasmic Dove chocolate commercials. Or maybe Calgon. 
No, not racy enough. Definitely dubbed chocolate. Here's another one. <laughs> Never underestimate the ability of white people to center ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is a woman who tweeted that she cried tears of joy the night that Biden was elected. And I know I probably don't have a lot. Um, I can't hammer on her too badly because, as I've admitted to you, in 2016, I actually cried when Donald Trump was elected because I was a simp cuck. <laughs> But she still thinks this is something to be proud of. Have some more. I do wish Hillary wouldn't use the language of boy and girl. It's erasing language for non-binary people. <laughs> and of course, Ms. Marr is a member of the Mickey Masketeer Club. Take a look at her here. <laughs> the best part of Arizona GOTV is my Biden grandpa hat. And more. Oh, I love this one. I know that hysteric white woman voice. I was taught to do it. I've done it. It's a disturbing recognition. While I don't recall ever using it to deliberately expose another person to immediate physical harm on my own cognizance, it's not impossible. That is whiteness. <laughs> this is SETI Alpha 5. <laughs> Had enough? Too bad, because now we're going to go to video. Mar used to be the CEO of Wikipedia, and here's what she had to say about that. I started by talking about the idea of free and open as some of our founding principles, sort of free and open source coming from the idea of the open source community. Well, I have come to <laughs> the opinion and the, and the perspective that free and open was a way of looking at the world that was inherently limited relative to what we were trying to achieve. Free and open has the best of intentionality, but in the end, what free and open often ended up doing, and particularly in the case of Wikipedia, was really capit recapitulating many of the same power structures and dynamics that exist offline prior to the advent of the internet. And so what we ended up seeing was Wikipedia really rebuilt this idea of knowledge as a whole around what the Western canon. You see the exclusion of communities, of languages, because of the ways in which Wikipedia is based on reliable sources. The idea of a written tradition is something that is particular to many, I mean, not, sorry, the idea of a written tradition, which is particular to some cultures and not to others, the ways in which we I'd ascribe notability often really comes from sort of this white male um, westernized construct around who matters in societies and who is elevated and whose voices. And so some of these ideas of sort of this radical openness really did not end up with the intention, really did not end up living into the intentionality of what openness can be. <laughs> okay, so as we know, writing is not better than not writing because, you know, some cultures don't have a written tradition. White male Western objectivity is racist. Living into the intention of what openness can be. Can anyone translate that for me? No, because it's retarded. She sounds like a character from a goddamn Christopher Guest movie. We can find all sorts of things to talk about and not talk about. Like soup. <laughs> and you know this is coming. Here's her obligatory TED Talk. But what about the hard things, the places where we are prone to disagreement, say politics and religion? Well, as it turns out, not only does Wikipedia's model work there, it actually works really well. Because in our normal lives, these contentious conversations tend to erupt over disagreement about what the truth actually is. But the people who write these articles, they're not focused on the truth. They're focused on something else, which is the best of what we can know right now. And after seven years of working with these brilliant folks, I've come to believe that they are onto something, that perhaps <laughs> for our most tricky disagreements, seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth might not be the right place to start. In fact, our reverence for the truth might be a distraction that's getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. Now, 
That is not to say that the truth doesn't exist, nor is it to say that the truth isn't important. Clearly, the search for the truth has led us to do great things, to learn great things. But I think if I were to really ask you to think about this, one of the things that we could all acknowledge is that part of the reason we have such glorious chronicles to the human experience and all forms of culture is because we acknowledge there are many different truths. And so, in the spirit of that. I'm certain that the truth exists for you, and probably for the person sitting next to you. But this may not be the same truth. This is because the truth of the matter is very often, for many people, what happens when we merge facts about the world with our beliefs about the world. So we all have different truths. They're based on things like where we come from, how we were raised, and how other people perceive us. No, 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 that's not true. <clears throat> I love her. Truth is relative. Seeking the truth and seeking to. This is mommy tone. This this is mommy tone. It's what I talk about. I'm talking about for years on NPR. Seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth might not be the right place to start. In fact, a reverence for the truth might be a distraction. That's getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. It's so unctuous. Well, yes, the truth is inconvenient to demagogues. She's also on record saying the First Amendment is an obstacle to controlling misinformation. <laughs> This is who rules us: a rich, attractive white woman. Who at the very same time tells us that we're shit for being white. She's shit for being white, but she's also very, very, very good for knowing that she's shit for being white, and it makes her millions of dollars. Catherine Marr is a puppet, a puppet character, but she's a siren. She's the mommy-toned temptress. Who coos in our ear to seduce us into believing that she's loving, and warm, and community-minded? What she wants is obedience, and she is ruthless. She will defame an underling like Uri Berliner, who spent 25 years putting his heart and soul into that company, and she'll throw his career away while making sure that his reputation is trashed. Catherine Marr is in reality. A bitch, and she is NPR. You got a bitch you need to talk about, or a bastard? <laughs> If you need someone to talk to one on one about an abusive situation, you can talk to me. You can book a one-hour conversation with me at joshuaslocum.net. If you need a sounding board for issues about bullying, narcissism, fractured families, work, academia, home, church, and more. I'd love to help you see your situation more clearly. If you'd like to walk through your options and game out how you might approach that situation, so if you're interested, check it out: joshuaslocum.net. And subscribers and supporters to Disaffected get a discount. We'll see you after the break. Do you get something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com/disaffected.
Welcome back. Since this is our first time live on Rumble, it's a good time for me to remind you, if you are watching us, and even if you're not watching us, will you please subscribe to us on Rumble? Those numbers actually help. The higher number of subscribers we get, the more people are going to see this, the more that Rumble is going to um, uh, to feature us. So make an account if you haven't, please sign up and subscribe to us here. Um, and thank you very much. Either a year or two years ago, we had parent Jeff Younger on the show. Um, Jeff was divorcing his pediatrician wife, Anne, um, and I'm going to mangle this pronunciation, Jorgulus. And she has set out to trans their little boy, I believe starting at about age seven. Jeff Younger, the father, has been prevented by family court from contacting his son. The courts, as usual, defer to the mother, even though her plan is to surgically mutilate her son's genitals after compromising him with puberty blockers and hormones. It's gotten even worse now. I'm going to read to you an update from The Blaze. Quote, Jorgulus moved their children, including their 11-year-old son, to California against the wishes of their father. The, the move was protected after Younger lost his petition in the Texas Supreme Court to force her to return the children to Texas. The court seems literally unable or unwilling to understand the reality of California's trans-sanctuary state laws. Like laws in Minnesota, Minnesota and Vermont, California promises parents that if they abscond to the state to trans their kid because it's illegal in the home state, then California will not cooperate with an out-of-state court. They will not cooperate with a, an arrest warrant. They will not extradite the parent or the child if the parent wants to trans the kid. This is in flagrant violation of the United States Constitution's Full Faith and Credit Clause, which requires all states to treat the official business of other states as if it were their own official business. That is what a republic is. And still, it's been two years since I've been pointing this out. I have yet to hear one legal scholar point out this constitutional violation. Let's go back to the Blaze article. Quote, the Texas Supreme Court denied his petition, claiming that Younger misinterpreted California law and that the current Texas court order preventing Jorgulus from giving their son these medical treatments would be honored in California. California currently has a transgender child trafficking law on the books. I'm breaking in here. That's a pro-trafficking law, not anti-trafficking. This is to facilitate child trafficking. SB 107, which allows the state to refuse lawful extradition orders from other states over issues related to so-called gender-affirming care. Uh, and here's what the judge said, quote, I concur in the court's denial of the petition because father is already in possession of a court order prohibiting mother from doing precisely what he fears she will do with his son. In October 2021, the district court, with mother's full agreement and indeed at her request, ordered that neither parent may treat a child with hormonal uh, suppression therapy, puberty blockers, and or transgender reassignment surgery, if any, without the consent of the parents or court order. Next quote. Proponents of the law claim SB 107 makes California a refuge for trans kids and their families. Law experts have long worried, warned, that these bills strip parental rights away from concerned parents, preventing any opposition to these medical treatments. That means that for Younger and his family, it will allow the mother to start harmful medical treatments on his child without his permission. Yes, that is indeed what it means. Next quote. Jorgulus, that's mom, promised Texas courts that she was not intent on sending their son to a gender clinic to receive irreversible treatments for his supposed gender dysphoria. But if that were the case, why would she be in a California court attempting to allow it to happen? What's going on with this court in Texas? What is difficult or impossible to put together here? This doesn't take deep powers of analysis. It's right there. Next quote. Now that Texas has ruled against Younger, there is little legal protection left for him to protect his son. He is not even allowed to argue against these treatments in the pro forma hearing April 25th, according to the national file. Let me guess, he doesn't have standing. <laughs> you got kids, you a parent, you're not going to have standing for shit real soon. 
Watch out. Be prepared. This is America in 2024. Now, in possibly hopeful news from Idaho, that state has a new law in force that makes it a felony to transition children. Naturally, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, has sued the state and won several injunctions that blocked the law. But now the U.S. Supreme Court has stepped in. The court ruled that Idaho's law can go into force. Quote, Idaho may implement a 2023 legislation that carries a maximum 10-year prison sentence for doctors who give hormone therapies, puberty blockers, or other, quote, gender-affirming treatments to patients younger than 18. This is made possible by the justices' order on Monday. This is from One America News. Next quote. The Vulnerable Child Protection Act of Idaho was blocked by U.S. District Judge B. Lynn Windmill in December. According to him, quote, gender-affirming health care is safe, effective, and medically necessary for some adolescents provided that it is delivered in compliance with standards established by groups like the Endocrine Society and, who? The World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Now, as established last week in a nearly 400-page report called the CASP Review from England, no one can any longer claim that these treatments are necessary or even safe for children. But alone among Western nations now, the U.S. continues to allow this mutilation of children and calls this evil care. Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch was the one writing the opinion that lifted the injunction in Idaho. Here's what he had to say. Quote, ordinarily, injunctions like these may go no further than necessary to provide interim relief to the parties. In this case, however, the district court went much further prohibiting a state from enforcing any aspect of its duly enacted law against anyone, Gorsuch wrote on Monday. Now, the ACLU was on hand to perform a narcissistic reversal, projecting their evil and sin onto the people who want to protect children from harm. They had this to say. Today's ruling allows the state to shut down care that thousands of families rely on while sowing further confusion and disruption. Nonetheless, today's result only leaves us all the more determined to defeat this law in the courts entirely, making Idaho a safer state to raise every family. Now, don't get too happy and don't be mistaken about this. The Supreme Court of the United States did not rule on the merits of this issue. They did not make a ruling condemning gender-affirming care. They didn't touch the subject matter at all. And I don't think we can read tea leaves and say, well, once it gets there, they're going to rule against it. Mm -mm. No, that's premature. There's no indication in this ruling of what will happen when a case actually comes before the high court. So don't be too complacent. In black people behaving badly, our new semi-regular feature, let's talk about reparations again. I'd like to remind you first of U.S. House Representative from Texas, Jasmine Crockett, and her her way. We featured her a few months ago. Um, here she is defending Joe Biden against an impeachment inquiry. I call this bringing the hood into the house. On because he's got 91 counts pending right now. But I will tell you what the president has been guilty of. He has unfortunately been guilty of loving his child unconditionally, and that is the only evidence that they have brought forward. And honestly, I hope and pray that my parents love me half as much as he loves his child. Until they find some evidence, we need to get back to the people's work, which means keeping this government open so that people don't go hungry in the streets of the United States. And I will yield. Ratchet, no. (laughs) To no one's surprise, Ms. Crockett believes black Americans are entitled to stop paying taxes and just get checks to pay him back for what Whitey done to him. (laughs) Here we, I'm going to read you a little from Fox News story. A House Democrat recently suggested that black Americans should be exempt from paying taxes as a form of reparations, but she admitted that the plan may not be a success as many within the community who are poor, quote, aren't really paying taxes in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I, as I sit here twisting my hanky until blood runs out of my fingers for the checks I just had to write to the Internal Revenue Service on Monday. 
The comments from Representative Jasmine Crockett, Democrat of Texas, came during her appearance on an episode of the Black Lawyers podcast, which was released Tuesday. During the interview with host Jake Carter, Crockett recalled a proposal from a celebrity to exempt black Americans from paying taxes and said she thought to herself that it was not necessarily a bad idea. Well, I mean, of course, all black people deserve uh, Louis Vuitton, not just big politician ladies, right? Here are a few of Ms. Crockett's quotes. So many black folk, not only do you owe for the labor that was stolen and killed and all the other things, right? But the fact is we end up being so far behind. She said, can you parse that? Send it on a postcard. (laughs) Disaffected Productions, Dystopian, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, Here's another quote. Um, If you do the no tax thing, For people that are already, say, struggling and aren't paying taxes in the first place, end quote, Crockett said before uh, podcast host Carter suggested, it doesn't matter to them and they may want those checks like they got during COVID rather than a tax exemption. Exactly. Crack it. (laughs) Crack it. Crack it. Crockett responded. You know, our government is increasingly hostile to freedom of speech and increasingly convinced that it has the legal and moral right to tell Americans what they may say and how they must think about cultural issues. I've been alarmed at the Jew-hating rhetoric that has burst out on college campuses and in pro-Hamas. No, not merely pro-Gazan, pro-Hamas demonstrations on the streets of our cities. Now I'm starting to get alarmed at the government response. One may find such views odious, but the legislature has no business doing this. Take a look at your screen. This is a tweet from Craig Kaplan with a screen capture um, of Congress in session. On a vote of 377 to 44 to 1, the House passed a resolution that the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is anti-Semitic and its use must be condemned. Must be condemned, really. In what way? Who will you be condemning? What form will the condemnation take? Just obnoxious fellow lawmakers like Rashida Tlaib? Or will you be condemning citizens, too? I don't like Tlaib. I don't like, and and frankly, I think she's a traitor. Um, But the government should not be doing this. We have to tolerate ugly speech as long as it's not directly inciting violence and it's not libelous. How long until the entire country forgets this right along with our Congress? The left, the progressives, have a problem with locus of control. This is part of the cluster B mindset. The narcissistic personality and the codependent people who are in the sway of the narcissists blame people for the reactions of third parties to what they say. You see this in the recent decision by the University of Southern California, uh, Los Angeles University. They decided to bar their valedictorian from delivering the commencement speech, and that's a historic first. Um, I'm going to read to you from NBC News. The University of Southern California has sparked condemnation from a leading Muslim group after it canceled a planned commencement speech by the valedictorian, citing security concerns due to tensions over the, quote, ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Asna Tabassum said she was told Monday that she would no longer be able to give a speech as she and other graduates at the Los Angeles University are celebrated on May 10th. University of Southern California Provost Andrew Guzman said in an announcement Monday that, quote, over the past several days, discussion relating to the selection of our valedictorian has taken on an alarming tenor. Here's a quote. The intensity of feelings fueled by both social media and the ongoing conflict in the Middle East has grown to include many voices outside of USC and has escalated to the point of creating substantial risks relating to security and disruption at our commencement, Guzman said. Next quote. Tabasim's Instagram account links to a slideshow encouraging people to, quote, learn about what's happening in Palestine and how to help. 
It calls for, quote, one Palestinian state, which it says, quote, would mean Palestinian liberation and the complete abolishment of the state of Israel. Tabassum said she added the link on her social media account five years ago and was not the author, according to NBC Los Angeles. The college says this is about safety. If this woman speaks, there might be safety concerns. Tabassum also claimed in her statement that in a meeting on Sunday, I asked about the alleged safety concerns and was told that the university had the resources to take appropriate safety measures for my valedictory speech but that they would not be doing so, <clears throat> excuse me, since increased security protections is not what the university wants to, quote, present as an image. And the last word from the provost, quote, there is no free speech entitlement to speak at commencement. The issue here is how best to maintain campus security and safety, period. Period. Did you go to the Catherine Marr School of Bitchery? I would say that this is not a road we want to go down, but we're already sliding all the way down the slippery slope. We are already there. This is the here, here. This is another way that the primary thesis of this show is demonstrated. This is the logic of the abusive family headed by a narcissistic parent, but scaled up to society. It's the it's the social version of the cowed children who attack each other and punish each other for talking back to mommy. You're going to make her hit us. The parent triangulates these siblings, setting them against each other. If they're occupied fighting each other as enemies, then mommy's will be done, won't it? It's the very thesis of this show, over and over. As in the home, so in society. And what we used to call domestic abuse has gone public and feral. All right, time for one more break. We don't have advertisers, but we have mwah, you, our lovely audience, and we appreciate you. Will you help us make the show? There are several ways to throw some dollars into the jar. First of all, if you just want to do a one-off, you don't want to subscribe, you don't want to do a monthly debit, I get it. Very easy to give a contribution of a buck, five bucks, 10 or 20. Go to disaffected.com and click on support us. Easy peasy. And uh, thank you to everybody who did donate recently. I'm sorry I got a little behind on the email, but I do personally acknowledge each of these. You will get a thank you email from me. But if you want to become a regular supporting member with access to our private Discord chat server full of fellow disaffectants, become a regular subscriber. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. And check us out this week on audio podcast. You're not going to get it on Rumble. You're not going to get it on YouTube. But we have a one-hour episode, audio only, with ex-Antifa member Ty King, including audience Q&A and interaction. And if you sign up to support us regularly, you'll get access to these live recordings. Come back and see us after the break to close out the show. Do you get something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected.
in prison. But for me, there is something wonderfully poetic about the fact that despite the fact that even if convicted, he's not going to go to prison, the first person to actually criminally prosecute Donald Trump is a black Harvard grad, the very kind of person that his former staff, the people who worked for him, Stephen Miller, et cetera, want to never be at Harvard uh, Law School. But he was. And he came out and graduated. He's prosecuting you, Donald. And a black woman is doing that same exact thing in Georgia. And a black woman forced you to pay a hundred and seventy five million dollar fine. That's out now also in question because the people who put it up, that might not be legit. Donald Trump is being held to account by the very multicultural, multiracial democracy that he's trying to dismantle. And for me, there's something poetic and actually wonderful about that. It hmm. says something good about our country that we're still capable of having that happen. Go DEI. My DEIs are bringing it home on today. Hmm. No, it's striking and a system that also is affording. You know, she's so repellent. My DEIs are bringing it home. Ugh. God, you know, she's not just stupid. This is my opinion. I think Joy Reid is a sadistic narcissist. She's not just self-involved. She is sadistic. She's wicked. She means harm to people. I just, the, the entire vibe I get off that woman is disturbing. <laughs> and, and listen, to the, again, as I said to you last week, you can get away with saying the most outrageously antisocial things if you are a black person that no one else would ever be allowed to say in this country. A black woman is getting a white man. It's, it's, it's naked. 20 years ago, even liberals would have objected loudly to this it's naked, vengeful racism. Not now. Well, actually, you know what? 20 years ago, no, they wouldn't have because it wouldn't have happened. Something has seriously changed. And what's up with that blonde wig, Joy? <laughs> Somebody said a couple weeks ago, it looks like she swiped up up top of Donald Trump's head. I agree. All right. The next Mookley. We've shown you and you've seen on social media um, lots of airport temper tantrums. This one is near the top of my list. <laughs> Guys, I thought she was wearing a body stocking, but no, wait, watch this. For those of you on audio, this woman is naked. She's only wearing a... Oh my God, full bush. Oh, what is she doing? Is she wielding her vagina at people? I didn't know you could do that. Is she done yet? No, I think there's more. Ocean, Ocean, leave, leave her Oh, she's going to keep going. Oh, my, oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Who's that up? Is it about airports? Uh, I am 
woman, hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore. <laughs> you know, I can imagine a lot of people are going to say, oh, she's having a mental health moment. She must be on drugs. She's having a terrible, well, she's obviously having a terrible times. I no longer, I, I don't default to this person must be on drugs anymore. We have all seen enough of this. It can't all be drugs. We have a serious mental health crisis in this country. There's no way to know how much of this actually happens, like in the world, the totality of it every year. And I, and obviously this stuff is made for social media and it's going to be concentrated there. But there does seem to be an awful lot of this public bad behavior going on. Um, I don't know what it is. All right. Let's go on to Canada. This is from Redux Magazine. Again, the best outlet out there for accurate information on what's going on with the trans insanity. Redux will tell you things that nobody else will tell you. Let's take a look at this. Canada. A transgender diaper fetish has won his legal bid, uh, bid to force the province of Ontario to cover a surgery that will preserve his penis and craft a, quote, vagina near his anus. The man will be flown out to Texas on the taxpayer dime for the procedure. And we have a picture here. Um, we don't get to see they's pretty face. But we do get to say see what they wrote. So th <laughs> I, this, I think this is Reddit, but I'm not sure. Any other transgender babies slash littles who are exclusively attracted to diapers? Kind of just wondering if this is a forever thing or if like once I get my gender issues sorted, maybe there might be more because it's so clouded by the gender complication. How was it for you guys and gals? I just always was an adult baby slash little and then I was always trans, but I totally always wondered if being trans was a factor in the, quote, asexualism of diapers. <laughs> it sounds like a Judith Butler paper, the asexualism of diapers in post-colonial France. <laughs> I'm sorry. The asexualism of diapers for me. Like, maybe I'd be attracted to people later or something. I'm going to be very seriously working to resolve the gender side in the very near future. COVID gives you a lot of time to think. Okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> He's actually getting what's known as a vaginus. Look for it in your surgeon's discards bin. Now, to take us out here, finally, a gender that takes you from spring all the way through winter. Did you know, however, there is a gender identity that is linked to the seasons? This is called gender season. And this is a gender identity I've only just learned about. It's a micro identity. It's not an identity that I have ever heard discussed before. It's a new one for me. Gender season is an individual who explores their gender identity in relation to a season or all the seasons. So this might be somebody whose gender expression and identity is linked to one season. So for example, winter, or this might be somebody whose gender identity and expression changes depending on the season.